Well, thank you to the Harry Frank Guggenheim Foundation for this kind invite to begin what I think will be a fantastic uh, speaker series on knowledge against violence. Um, thank you in particular to, to President uh, Daniel Wilhelm, who just introduced me to the Director of Research, uh, off screen, uh, Joel Wallman, and the Program Officer, um, uh, Nailadi Hawana, and to the Board of Directors for uh, not only supporting my work over the last several years, but also for enabling so many of us uh, to produce research for no and knowledge against violence in all of its complexity uh, and heterogeneity. Thank you to all those joining at home and uh, from various parts uh, of the world in different time zones. I'm really looking forward to the conversation and discussion. So I will try and keep my presentation to uh, about 20 minutes today and I look forward to, to your questions. So as, uh, as, as has been mentioned, I'm, I'm gonna be speaking today primarily about um, this, this book, uh, The War Lawyers, uh, The United States, Israel and Juridical Warfare. But given the mandate of uh, the Harry Frank Guggenheim Foundation and given the mandate of uh, the speaker series, I wanted to open with some general comments uh, about violence and about how uh, I approach uh, violence in my work um, before I then get on to talk uh, more specifically about the work I've done with military lawyers. So let me say a few things. <clears throat> First, that defining violence isn't an easy thing to do. People far smarter than I have have tried and yet, in every definition, at least that I've come across, uh, uh, all of them are plagued by a central problem, the problem of under or inclusivity. Define violence broadly enough that it includes symbolic and linguistic, representational and psychological, as well, of course, as physical and material violence. And it might seem that little, if anything, can escape being named violence. But define it narrowly, only, as a physical act, a punch to the face, an exploding bomb, the cold steel of a prison cell door, and we will inevitably miss so much that is violent in this world. The creep of climate change, the insidiousness of coercive control, the particularities of gender and racial-based violence, the cruel optimism even of a better, more equitable future. So I don't, I'm afraid, this evening have uh, a good answer to this quandary of how one might define violence or if I do it is simply to dodge the question and say that I think that there are many different types or orders of violence and that perhaps po imposing some sort of rigid definition might well be an act of violence itself and of course probably my evasion of the question itself is some sort of violence. But so as not to completely dodge uh, that question this evening, I want to provide five or six points here about how uh, I think about and how I approach violence and how uh, it affects my work. These are some sort of semi-random thoughts that, that I wanted to, to prepare as I thought about this speaker series in relation to my own work. This is very particular to me and, 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 and my uh, training uh, and instruction as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a geographer and as a political geographer. So, in my work generally, uh, and I'm thinking about both the project uh, that I'm going to be speaking about tonight and a future project and current project that I'm doing on, on injury and war, I've tended to and think about violence in a quite narrow sense and a quite literal sense. I've been interested in how late modern militaries uh, kill, uh, kill civilians especially uh, in different war zones, and I've, I'm in increasingly interested in how uh, they injure them and cause trauma. And this is a, if you like, a sort of quite narrow sense uh, of violence that, that animates my work. And um, here, as I go through, I sort of, I, I will elect some scholars uh, that I've chosen that I sort of drove from. Um, the second thing to say about my uh, understanding of violence is that I believe, uh, and my supervisor, Derek Gregory, um, uh, is, is, a, is a great fan of this, this idea that um, our imaginings of the world are uh, a part of world making, which is to say that our representations, our understandings of the world, the geographical uh, areas within it, are not separate from, uh, from the world itself, but actively create and shape it. And of course, I'm speaking here about geographical imaginations and, and drawing from uh, the work uh, of Edward Said. Those uh, representations, those uh, regimes of, uh, of, of representing uh, and performing the world uh, can be, uh, of course, extremely violent. Uh, and that's something which really animates uh, my work. 
Uh, the third thing that I think about when I think about violence and something that um, in a way is a sort of auto critique, uh, I've been interested in, if you like, sort of obvious or, or uh, at face uh, value uh, violence that, that one can easily understand the literal type of violence. Uh, as my work goes on, I'm more and more interested in the, what we might call hidden or unseen or what uh, Rob Nixon has called uh, slow violence, uh, the violence that's out of sight or at least out of sight in some uh, regimes uh, and some um, areas uh, of public life uh, and so on and drawing from a series of scholars uh, there. And I think actually the violence of the law that I'm speaking about tonight is somehow uh, uh, being hidden, uh, hidden through some historic process. Um, and then I think about violence in relation to the state. Uh, much of what I talk uh, about tonight will be uh, state violence. I'm um, thinking about here on the work of Max Weber, who famously said that uh, he defined the state as the human community that successfully claims the monopoly of the legitimate use uh, of physical force. And whilst I think that state monopoly has been undone in, in all kinds of ways, uh, inside and outside of the sphere of war, it is the state, at least in my work uh, so far uh, and, uh, and tonight, which really animates uh, uh, violence uh, being done. Um, I am thinking about violence increasingly as something which is creative as well as destructive, which is to say that I think that violence unleashes potential, that violence creates its conditions of its own resistance and, and, and those sorts of things. Uh, I think in my earlier work, I've, I've been sort of too... Um, simplistic and not dialectical enough in my thinking about violence. And so I think that it is a creative, which is not to say necessarily good, uh, of course, but, but creative as well as destructive process. And then finally, I want to say something about specific, specifically about law, because that's what uh, I'll be talking about tonight. Uh, there's a whole, of course, history here and a whole set of political theory, which, is, which, which can't be covered uh, in a slide, let alone a bullet point on a slide. But suffice it to say, uh, that I see the relationship between law and violence is not necessarily mutually exclusive. I don't believe that we sort of got rid of our Hobbesian devils and replaced it with this uh, liberal law uh, Leviathan, or if we have, we haven't totally uh, succeeded, and that violence continues to animate law uh, in all kinds of ways. So with that sort of polka dot uh, beginning uh, on violence, I'm going to dive now uh, back uh, into the book. So over the last 20 or 30 years, uh, the world's most advanced militaries, including the US, Israel and the United Kingdom, invited a really small number, or a small number at first, uh, of legal professionals into the heart of their targeting operations. These military legal professionals, also known as military lawyers, also known as military advisors, I call them war lawyers, but it doesn't really matter, have assumed a, an essential role in adjudicating who lives uh, and who dies. Uh, in modern war. So if those of you perhaps have seen the film uh, Eye in the Sky, a 2015 uh, British film uh, that was a uh, sort of recreation uh, of a fictional drone strike that took place in Kenya. On the screen here, you see this image that they're basically the, the British are trying to uh, uh, bomb uh, this building because there's some suspect terrorists, alleged terrorists inside. And on the top of the screen there, you see Helen Mirren, and in the foreground, her lawyer uh, and Helen Mirren is asking, as, it, as the text there says, are we clear to engage yes or no? So we have this derogation of responsibility from the military commander who, who should make the decision under this legal advisor. And in the film, the legal advisor sort of gets in the way uh, of this military uh, operation. And so my research is essentially about that, for, that figure in the foreground, uh, about that set of legal professionals who have come to play, I think, a profound role uh, in the conduct of modern war. I want to say, uh, because it's worth underscoring, and I think in any social study, that, that the world we inherit uh, is an inevitable one, and uh, the role of military lawyers is very new historically. If one goes back, uh, you know, even to the mid-20th century, you do not find military lawyers doing uh, what they did. So back in 2013, uh, this, uh, this uh, really uh, occurred to me uh, during an interview in which one of Israel's most uh, foremost uh, military lawyers, most senior military lawyers, said this, um, looking back to the 1990s, it was unheard of to have a military lawyer in the room in a military operation planning meeting during the 1990s. And now they, he's referring to the Israeli military, uh, can't move without them. 
So as I say, it's a historically uh, novel. I'll say a little bit more about that in a second. But this, uh, from the sort of moment in the interview, uh, gave me my central question, or one of the two central questions that I pursue in the book. And that is, is, is how and why uh, did this transition take place? How is it that militaries can get by for centuries doing the business of uh, the complicated business of, of, of war and armed conflict? And yet late in the 20th century, they come to rely on lawyers so much that they, they quote, can't move without them. Uh, how is that the case and what happened? And that, that, was, that was the central question uh, that drove my study. Just to say a few things about the scope of the book, I hope we get time in the question and answer to talk uh, about some of the places that, that concern the book, especially Afghanistan, uh, given that it's been uh, in the news recently, of course, because uh, of the American withdrawal. But the book, uh, in focusing on the US and Israel, focuses on three principal theatres of war that those states have been involved in in recent years. This isn't, of course, an exhaustive list, but I've looked closely uh, at targeting operations uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan um, and the West Bank and Gaza, although mainly Gaza, because uh, Israel targeting operations uh, have shifted from the West Bank to Gaza in, in, in around the mid 2000s. We can talk about that if we like to. Um, and historically, the book begins in Vietnam and goes up to more or less the present for about 2018, where I sort of had to cut off uh, and finish writing the book for publication uh, and the war with ISIS uh, in, in, in Iraq and Syria is where the book stops. Uh, it starts in Vietnam uh, because uh, the argument in the book is uh, that in, out of Vietnam, out of the US experience of Vietnam, for all kinds uh, of reasons, some of which were to do with the commission of US war crimes in, in My Lai and elsewhere, uh, the US military begins a, a self-institutionalization or self-legalization process to learn some of the lessons. And one of the upshots were, of, of that was that it began to operationalize uh, international humanitarian law or the laws of war and sort of uh, use it as a tool or use it as what they call by their own terms uh, a force multiplier uh, and, and so the argument is that law becomes important in the post-Vietnam era but it's not for a couple uh, decades later that military lawyers are incorporated uh, into this this targeting apparatus. Uh, just a little bit more context and background um, military lawyers have been around for centuries. The US uh, Judge Advocate General Corps, which is the sort of name of the, the corps to which uh, military lawyers in the US belong, boasts that it's the oldest uh, and largest law firm uh, in the US, which is actually quite the boast for, for uh, a country of many lawyers. Um, they've been around for centuries, but they didn't do um, uh, the stuff that they do today. Uh, they, they, at least they certainly weren't involved in targeting operations. Uh, they did all kinds of things behind the scenes. They did tax law, they did divorce or they did uh, military justice issues, but they weren't involved with, you know, what we call the tip of uh, the sphere uh, of, of war. They weren't involved in lethal operations uh, at all. That involvement came uh, after Vietnam uh, with, uh, with uh, the US uh, involvement in uh, Iraq part one, uh, that is the first Gulf War and in, in, in the invasion uh, of Iraq uh, on the back of uh, the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait in 1990 and 1991. And there for the first time, military lawyers become involved extensively in the oversight of what is targeted, which uh, infrastructures, which people uh, and how they're targeted uh, on the ground. Um, the US sends lots of military lawyers over to uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, to Riyadh, to underground bunkers where they have these targeting cells uh, I spoke to most of those involved and interviewed them for, for those Air Force planners. Uh, and that's where the air war was conducted uh, it, with unprecedented uh, number of lawyers at the time in, uh, involved in those operations. But the argument in the book and really the, the latter half of the book focuses on the post 9-11 era, partly because of the proliferation of wars, partly because of the, the you know, proliferation of the size of the wars and the invasions, of course, uh, of, of Afghanistan in 2001 and Iraq in 2003, which is when uh, military lawyers are deployed uh, in, in ever greater numbers uh, and become essential to uh, what's, what's politely called the targeting cycle, um, but what is often referred to in, in private company as, as the kill chain. Um, uh, we'll talk about more uh, about that later as well. Um, just in terms of methods, I'll, I'll, I'll go say this very quickly. Uh, I interviewed uh, over 60 uh, legal advisors uh, and, and operators, by operators just means sort of anyone loosely involved with, with uh, military uh, operations, 
um, could be uh, commanders or drone pilots or uh, intelligence analysts, those sorts of things. Uh, I also did a lot of analysis of lots of documents, partly why my PhD uh, took uh, a long time because there was so much to read. Um, you can say many things about the US military, but one thing you can't accuse them of uh, is not being a prolific publisher. They publish lots of stuff, part, some of it's leaked, some, much of it's published, there's lots of doctrine uh, and there's lots for scholars uh, to analyze. It's a real uh, resource actually, I think, for, for, for scholars, um, they're prolific. Uh, and then I did some archival research uh, in, uh, in Maryland and elsewhere uh, for the Vietnam component of the research. Happy to talk about uh, 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 interviews and, and, and methods um, in the Q&A as well, of course. So now the arguments, uh, we'll get to uh, some of the uh, more um, basic arguments of the book. Uh, so there's, I'll try not to be too confusing, it's easier to do this in person and then I can answer all your questions as they come up, but uh, there are three sets of arguments that run across the book. The first argument has three <laughs> components to it, I hope I haven't lost you already. Um, so what we're concerned with with military lawyers is they are uh, interpreting uh, all kinds of laws, actually, and all scales of law. Uh, but the main one that we're dealing with, I'm going to refer to it as the laws of war. People call it international humanitarian law. People also call it law of armed conflict. But for all intent and purposes, it is simply the law that applies to uh, war. Once war is already underway, there's a whole other set of legal rules for whether we should go to war in the first place. Uh, so this is this is that subset of law that we're dealing with, and the argument, uh, and this is I think a relatively uncontroversial one, at least from uh, what it would be from my perspective, is that these laws of war, uh, uh, as they are understood and interpreted, have some level uh, of indeterminacy, although that indeterminacy is not um, infinite. Uh, so as the slide here says, that basically different groups of people fundamentally i think disagree on the, the power and purpose of of the laws of war the basic principles their content uh and here we've got examples of uh man means military aged male uh it, between european continental states and for example the united states and israel we have huge legal arguments over this distinction between something called hostile act versus hostile intent which is uh, basically this idea of you know when one is targeting um uh, someone do they have to be engaged in a hostile act or do they have to be showing hostile intent? Of course, anyone who knows anything about law um, knows that that's a fairly big distinction. Uh, I won't go into the particulars, but suffice it to say that almost at every turn uh, that you find fundamental and significant disagreements. Uh, and that's partly, I think, a structure of the law, partly because it's the law is worded such that it, it needs to allow lots of space for different states to interpret it uh, as they wish. The second part of that is, you know, that's a sort of uncontroversial. The second part of it is that, as understood by the US and Israel in the second half of the 20th century, that indeterminacy of the law uh, was used as a harness and seen uh, as a resource, uh, as an opportunity. Uh, I've referred to this language uh, already of force uh, multiplication. And one of the key things that came out of the Vietnam War was a set of military lawyers who were adamant not to only pay attention to the restrictions in international humanitarian law but also to pay attention to the rights uh, of commanders under the laws of war to emphasize things like military necessity to emphasize things like protection uh, of forces which are a sort of counterweight to the more humanitarian principles with that that many human rights uh, scholars and practitioners and many many publics i think sort of associate uh, more ordinarily with uh, with the laws of war. Um, and then finally, so, um, you know, you have this indeterminacy, opportunities for interpretation, exploited as a resource. Uh, and uh, finally, I think in the 21st century, especially, we see those interpretations as, as themselves, uh, as um, controversial as they sometimes might be when they're first, uh, uh, first floated. Uh, becoming uh, themselves lawmaking. I think there's lots of different examples on this, uh, whether you look at drone warfare, whether you look at targeted killing. Uh, um, but, but what the book is really concerned about is a more uh, micro level uh, of law, whereby the power of the legal word when advice is given has some sort of lawmaking effect in that sphere of, uh, of the war room, uh, that, that the, law, the lawyer's words for all intent and purposes to the commander 
although they formally don't constitute law in the same sense that a judge or a decree or a legislation constitutes law for all intent and purposes something is is law making uh, about that moment and so that's what it's about and i think by and large the us and israel in the post 9 11 era have created a whole paradigm actually in which uh, uh, this uh, kind of interpretation uh, goes many states disagree with it, of course uh, but but it's in some senses uh, become uh, law because it's been unopposed the uh, upshot to that argument is is, uh, is 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 for me a critique of liberal uh, invocations of law and international law specifically so here i'm in conversation with a great scholar jens david ochlin who uh, wrote about the early um, uh, sort of nasty Bush administration lawyers, the ones that you know we all have come to love to hate, uh, those uh, involved in the torture uh, memos, uh, those involved in, in, in the Guantanamo and those things who, who legally justified it. And he said that you know international law is under attack because of because of those because of those lawyers. My argument is a little different, uh, and it says that that is, in part basically the uh, international law is also the medium of assault. Uh, it's not only being assaulted, you know, from from some sort of exterior uh, uh, thing, uh, but actually international law is, in some cases, I think, become uh, the very vehicle or the very language through which um, uh, the violence uh, continues and takes place. It's a, I think, important uh, but but subtle difference. Uh, the um, second set of arguments is really about the targeting cycle and about what the US military call uh, the uh, kill chain. I'm going to go quickly over this slide, otherwise I won't finish uh, in time. But one of the amazing things, I'm a political geographer, one of the most amazing things in coming to study uh, US and Israeli military operations and UK operations over the last decade has been that in order to understand its geographies, in order to understand its, the spaces in which war takes place it is mind-boggling and you know even after a year of, of, of studying it to understand the intelligence collection to understand where drones are flown from where all the information comes from that the nsa the various parts of the machine the cia which is secret the you know department of state department of defense all of which have operational centers across the middle east in asia uh, and obviously back in in conus as they call it continental united states to actually get to a point where a decision is made in, in real time about uh, you know the, the right to strike, the right to take life in a place like Afghanistan, you have involved large parts of, of the planet uh, with with the intelligence, with the uh, with all kinds of things, which, which is um, you know mind-boggling, like I say. So the first point is is, is that really that that late modern killing is extremely complicated, more complicated I think than it ever has been. Uh, with that, uh, dispersed geographies becomes, uh, for me, uh, um, uh, a displacement of responsibility, partly because, you know, this is Zygmunt Bauman's uh, classic critique, that, that because there's so many people involved in, in the production of violence, uh, no one person is responsible for the whole thing, and so this the responsibility is displaced. That is partly why military lawyers are brought in to sort of uh, 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 shore up that responsibility and accountability within the decision making process. And yet, time and again, the book shows this constant slippage. Uh, you know, you ask commanders whose responsibility it is to make a decision, they'll say it's theirs, but they will also say that the uh, most important person in the, in the kill chain uh, is the lawyer. You ask the lawyer who uh, makes the decision, and then they say, uh, of course, it's a command. And that's just a sort of small example of, of this displacement. Um, the problem is when you fight war over such a vast uh, spatial and, and, and temporal uh, terrain is that the very complexity enters into the military operations. And so the proverbial fog of war gets in the way and, and you find uh, oneself blaming machines, blaming lack of intelligence, uh, blaming other people, blaming the army when it's the Air Force, the Air Force blaming the army and so on. So there's this sort of displacement of responsibility, which is, I think, classic in war. But it, the argument is that it reproduces itself actually uh, it's not it, it doesn't stop the buck doesn't stop with the lawyer and the buck doesn't stop with the commander um just quickly on this slide i uh, there there are a couple of different types uh, of, of ways that militaries uh, target today one is the sort of pre-planned in advance where they know um you know early days of the war on terror what they want to strike they know where some buildings are, they know where people are storing weapons and they strike them early on in the war. But by far the most prominent uh, aspect of war now is what they call dynamic uh, or, or uh, unplanned targeting, which happens 
on the fly, which happens quickly, often uh, in minutes and hours in response to real time. And that's been, been enabled by drone technologies, by uh, live visual feeds. Uh, and so the book has two chapters, one on, on, on this plan targeting and one on uh, unplanned targeting. Um, I didn't know that I was going to write uh, two chapters on this, but uh, basically the, the left-hand side, uh, uh, that graphic is the sort of best practice. It's all of the, the legal accountability mechanisms, the, the, the stops, the checks, the balances that, that one needs to go through operationally before one, one executes uh, a mission, uh, before, you know, before you kill things and, and or, uh, kill people or destroy things. Uh, much of that, however, goes out the window on the left-hand side because there's that need. Maybe some troops are on the ground. You need, uh, you know, you need to release the bomb quickly to, to kill the enemy uh, because your enemy, are your your own side, are taking fire. So much of the sort of what I, you know, call sort of best practice. Much of that it doesn't go out the window completely. There are there are uh, many things in place to stop it. But when, as I will show from testimony in a second, when both lawyers and commanders have to make second uh, split second decisions. The law is something that we associate with a deliberative process, uh, uh, and that that does not apply when when one has to make decisions on the ground uh, when lives and deaths uh, are on the line. It comes with all sorts uh, of problems. Um, what does responsibility look like uh, when one has to make a decision uh, in a second? And of course, this is compounded by. Uh, algorithmic warfare and the displacement of responsibility into increasingly onto algorithms and decision making to algorithms. Uh, you know, the US Navy now has the capability of a drone that can take off itself, fly, release a bomb, and then land on itself, all via a predetermined algorithm. So it, it's becoming more and more complicated. The third, sets, uh, third set of arguments um, uh, here are the last set. And it's something uh, that builds from, from the second uh, pit that I've just been talking about. And that is that military lawyers engage in legal advice, but they engage in something much more, and I think much more profound than, than a sort of straightforward, formalistic legal uh, reading of legal advice might, uh, might normally uh, admit. So in some instances, commanders look to lawyers for something uh, more uh, than legal advice. They ask yes or no questions, which, which sort of beg, you know, the, the obvious answer to that is there's no such thing as a yes or no uh, question. Uh, they often ask for something uh, approximating permission. So I wanted to share three testimonies here, two from the book and one since it's come through that I think demonstrate this quite powerfully and speak to this, this profound uh, sense in which this, this power uh, that law and lawyers have uh, on the battlefield today. The first one was an interview I did with a very senior uh, US Air Force uh, um, military lawyer who said that sometimes I feel more like a chaplain than a lawyer because the questions that commanders are asking us aren't necessarily legal questions. They're looking more for absolution uh, than for legal advice. Militaries have chaplains, of course, and they also have lawyers, but here there's a really interesting uh, blurring of them, you know, looking uh, for absolution for some sort of moral support. One of the most senior uh, military lawyers uh, in, in the entire uh, Judge Advocate General Corps uh, I interviewed, and he said something similar, or at least something interesting, that legal advice is being used by military forces and their commanders to help reinforce in the mind of combatants that what they're doing is the right thing. And this is one of the many psychological factors that needs to be taken into account when commanders are in a complex process of getting human beings prepared to, frankly, kill other human beings in the name uh, of the state. This is a theme which comes up uh, again and again, both for commanders uh, and lawyers, that, they are, that the lawyers are, are glad to be there because of the, you know, the Harry Frank Guggenheim is interested in questions of psychological violence. Well, here you have, the, have its opposite, a sort of psychological crutch for the enabling uh, uh, of violence, uh, the book argues. And then finally, uh, a new testimony which has come out from some terrific writing done by, uh, by uh, a US military lawyer. Um, this man was involved in more than, and I repeat this, more than a thousand targeting operations in Afghanistan, more than 1,000 targeting operations. And he's written an account about this uh, in which he tries to come to terms with how one can reckon with the uh with such an involvement such a high uh, high level of lives in afghanistan and he says that i as the legal advisor and being asked by the commander whether he may legally kill these three humans 
I am judge, he the jury, and executioner. I turn to the commander on the ground in Afghanistan. This is, I'm leery. I've no legal objections per se, but this isn't clean cut and I'm uncomfortable. My intuition demands caution, patience, but no one cares about my intuition. They only want the law. Any issues, Eric? The commander asks. Eric uh, is the lawyer. And no legal objection, I decree. And with those words, he realizes that the power, the godlike, and in fact, what he calls divine like power that those words have, those words are not simply uh, legal advice. So in that moment, they are something, uh, I think, much more profound than that, because of course, the result of those words are that the operation goes ahead. Uh, and I think there's a really complicated, really interesting interplay between the lawyer and the commander uh, at, at that moment. Um, I'm going to skip over a couple of slides here. Um, this is just, just because uh, in the interest of time. Um, one of the things which, which animates the book in the background, uh, because everything I've said so far is a quite narrow history of the military lawyer, that has taken place in a much more broader uh, sociological, te uh, sociotechnological uh, field. And there are many things across the late 20th and early 21st century that have come to. Uh, um, to, 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 to say why, uh, why war has become a sort of juridical field or why it's become uh, more important. I put some of these uh, up here uh, on the screen. Uh, in interest of time, I won't go through them all, but um, if anyone is interested in, in seeing the slides, I'd be more than happy uh, to, to share them uh, and to email them uh, out to you. Uh, these are things which are, are to do with the way in which war has fought, has changed across the 20th century, which lend themselves towards law and to legal advisors. And then there is another uh, set here of uh, issues uh, and questions which arise, which are more intrinsic, if you like, to uh, law, to the law uh, itself, uh, in which you know, we have turned, for example, uh, to, to human rights and, and the human rights movement of the 1970s, to the additional protocols from uh, international humanitarian law in the 1970s. Uh, more and more turned to, you know, uh, increasing uh, aversion to civilian casualties, push for accountability mechanisms. And all of these things, I think, have made war uh, become more juridical. And, and in some senses, then, the turn towards military lawyers, the turn towards a language of law has, is in some part because of these broader movements become inevitable uh, in, in, in the early 20th, uh, early 21st century. Um, so I want to end or begin to wrap up the, the final part of the presentation with, uh, with uh, the following testimony that I, I think speaks to both the simultaneous power, but also the impotence uh, of legal uh, advice uh, on the modern battlefield. And this is, again, uh, this uh, Major Eric uh, Liddick, who I just quoted before. Bear in mind, this is the man uh, who was involved in, in over a thousand uh, targeting operations since return from Afghanistan, several uh, rotations in Afghanistan actually, is suffering from uh, major uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, and also what he calls and refers to uh, as moral injury, uh, that he has committed acts which go against his own uh, moral compass. Reflecting on this, he says that he'll never know with absolute certainty whether those three congregating individuals deserve to die. And I will also never unsee uh, in forever echoing detail, the child who, spirited, who sprinted into view from an adjacent courtyard or the crowded marketplace full of children or the slender man as he cradled the child, child's limp and lifeless body, all the frightened family as it sought to cover, or the woman as she lamented God's indifference. I'll never know whether I could have altered fate or prevented the loss of innocent lives had I only done more. Had I only spoken up, had I only insisted on something, anything different. And this is, I think, the norm uh, in the kill chain. This takes place as you and I sleep, as you, you and I go about a daily business. The US targeting cycle, especially Israeli one to some extent, is a, is a machine uh, which never sleeps. So I want to end, this is my final slide, and then I'll shut up, I promise, with some broader reflections on, on what some of this means in relation to law and violence. So law offers a framework for the non-arbitrary, non-excessive and necessary metting out of force in modern aerial targeting operations. It offers rules to guide conduct and gives commanders and militaries alike 
reassurance that their violence is subject to something called the rule of law. But that law is not yet settled, and that law is also part of the field of war's violence. Legal advice reassures some that what they're doing is the right thing, but others are haunted, as we have just seen, by their own legal advice. Law tries to clean up war, and to a significant extent, of course, it does. The fact that Cicero, uh, who said famously that in times of law of war, the law falls silent, is fundamentally wrong is testimony to the work done by militaries, humanitarians and scholars over the last couple of centuries, and especially over the last 50 years or so. But law too is messy. And what my book shows is not the clean vision of war held up by proponents of liberal ethical war, nor utopian technologies who offer technical solutions to ethical and political problems. And I have a good company here with many other scholars who have made similar arguments. What remains is the mess of war touched by law and legal advice, an enemy post carefully destroyed, a terror plot thwarted, an Iranian general killed, but also a slender man cradling a child's limp and lifeless body. And I thought it was appropriate there to end with a scene from uh, Afghanistan, uh, a real life targeting operation that took place uh, just a couple of months ago. Uh, an operation that went horribly wrong, mistaken intelligence uh, led to the death of 10 civilians targeted as a last act in a final act of US warfare in Afghanistan. With that, I will finish. Sorry for going over time and I really look forward to the questions. Thank you very much.